Today we'll talk about the anatomy of the mandible. The mandibular denture is a lot more difficult than that maxillary denture, and it's absolutely critical that you really understand the anatomy of the mandible to make that mandibular denture work. When we refer to an area of the complete denture or to the arch, we often call the areas of the denture by the following names. The area from canine to canine we refer to as the labial area of the denture, the most prominent landmark of that area being the labial frenum. As we go posteriorly, we come to an area where we find two frena positioned bilaterally. This area is referred to as the buccal frenum area. Just posterior to the frenum, that area lateral to where the posterior teeth would have been is referred to as the buccal area of the denture. The retromolar pads are a prominent landmark of this next area referred to as the distal buccal area of the denture. When we turn the corner, this area in orange is called the distal lingual area of the mandibular denture. There is a depression lingual to the retromolar pad that is an important landmark called the retromylohyoid fossa. The area lingual to the premolar and molar region is called the midlingual area of the denture. And lastly, the area lingual to the six anterior teeth from buccal frenum to buccal frenum is referred to as the sublingual area or the sublingual crescent. Here are some relative muscles and their relationship to the position on the cast. Incisivus labi inferioris and depressor labi inferioris arise from the mandibular alveolar processes and blend with orbicularis oris. Both of these muscles present possible problems with denture extension. Mentalis elevates the skin of the chin and turns the lower lip outward. The mentalis reduces the depth of the lower vestibule when it contracts. This muscle is capable of dislodging the mandibular denture, especially when the residual ridge is at the same height as the origin of the muscle. This is the case when the ridge resorbs severely as seen on this cast. It can dictate the level of the extension of the labial flange. Surgical repositioning of the muscle is sometimes used to extend the flange area. The mental foramen is an opening in the mandible in the area between the two premolars. It is where the mental nerve exits the mandible and enters the tissues giving innervation to the lip. When a person has a large sized ridge, the nerve is usually buckled to the alveolar ridge. But when extreme resorption has taken place, the mental foramen may be on the crest of the ridge as shown on this arch. The depressor anguli oris affects the position of the buccal frenum when functioning and it can dislodge the denture when it contracts. It is positioned in the area where the canines used to be located. Buccinator provides support and mobility for the tissues of the cheek. It originates from the pterygoal mandibular raphe, or ligament, and follows an the external oblique line to the mesial aspect of the first molar, and then ascends towards the corner of the mouth. On the mandible, it becomes part of the denture-bearing area, especially when extreme resorption of the mandible has taken place. The action of the buccinator does not actually dislodge the denture but the, um, in the buccal area because the uh, direction of the fibers are parallel to the occlusal plane. The fibers of buccinator run perpendicular to the muscle fibers of the masseter muscle. When masseter is activated, it pushes the buccinator medially against the dis distal buccal flange of the denture, bordering the area of the retromolar pad. This area of the denture must be contoured to accommodate this interaction between masseter and buccinator. This is sometimes referred to as the masseteric notch or groove on the denture. The genioglossus arises from the superior mental spine or the superior genial tubercles on the inner surface of the symphysis near the midline. The superior fibers go to the tip of the tongue while the middle go to the root of the tongue. The inferior fibers attach to the hyoid bone. This muscle can extrude and retract the tongue, which has a profound effect on the length of the lingual flange of the mandibular complete denture.
The mylohyoid and geniohyoid constitute the muscular floor of the mouth. The action of the mylohyoid muscle can unseat a denture. If the denture flange is ex extended below and under the mylohyoid line, it will impinge on the mylohyoid muscle and can affect its actions adversely. The fibers run perpendicular to the mandible and are much like a hammock. Since the fibers are short toward the anterior of the mandible, the denture cannot extend below the mylohyoid line from second premolar to second premolar. Since the fibers are longer and fall downward in the posterior area, the denture can go slightly below the mylohyoid from the molar region to the retromylohyoid fossa. The posterior extent of the mandibular denture is determined by the pharyngeal muscles. The action of the superior constrictor muscle determines the contour of the posterior lingual flange of the mandibular denture. I will point out some important anatomic landmarks on the cast. The three triangular areas represent the labial frenum, the lingual frenum, and the buccal frenum, of which the buccal frenum there are two, one on each side of the arch. The area being inscribed in red is called the buccal shelf. It is bounded by the external oblique line on the cast and the crest of the alveolar ridge. This is the main denture bearing area. It is able to take forces of mastication the best. Next, you will feel a ridge on the lingual surface of the mandible that is called the mylohyoid ridge. And it is the attachment area for the mylohyoid muscle which dictates the depth of the lingual flange of the denture. We cannot violate this muscle through the areas of second premolar to second premolar as the muscle fibers of the mylohyoid run perpendicular to the ridge and are very short anteriorly. The fibers of the anterior are so sharp that they cannot resist impingement. In the posterior area, the long hemic shaped muscle allows us to go below mylohyoid muscle slightly to get flange extension and retention. The blue oval points out an important landmark called the retromolar pad. It is a secondary support area for the denture as it will be covered by the denture flange. The area between canine to canine on the lingual aspect of the alveolar ridge is called the sublingual crescent area. The position of the attachment of the muscles in this area vary, but all these muscles in this area determine the length of the denture flange on the lingual. The labial vestibule extends from canine to canine and the length of the denture in this area is largely determined by mentalis muscle. The buccal vestibule runs roughly from canine area to retromolar pad. The scooped out area back in the distal buccal of the flange is due to the influence of the masseter muscle flexing and putting pressure on the buccinator muscle and thus pushing the mandibular denture in this area. When this is a prominent area of the mouth, this notch is placed in the denture um, in, to prevent the denture from being knocked up or dislodged in a superior direction. It is sometimes called the masseteric notch or groove on the mandibular denture. The retromylohyoid fossa area is very important for the mandibular denture. This is an area where, when utilized, we can gain some additional retention for the denture. The distal of the denture must extend into this fossa. Its length is determined by the pharyngeal muscles, mainly superior constrictor, and the anatomy of the fossa. Anterior to the retromylohyoid fossa is another depression in the mandible called the lingual sulcus or the premylohyoid fossa. This slide gives you a muscular picture of the anatomy of the mylohyoid muscle. Note the hammock shaped appearance of the fibers of this muscle and how they run perpendicular to the mandibular ridge. The mandibular flange of the denture cannot be placed more inferior than the attachment of the genioglossal muscle in function. The labial vestibule is limited inferiorly by the mentalis muscle lingually by the residual ridge, and labially by the lip. Incisivus labi inferioris and depressor labi inferioris arise from the mandibular alveolar processes and blend with the orbicularis oris. 
Both of these muscles present possible problems with flange extension in this area. Mentalis elevates the skin of the chin and turns the lip outward. The mentalis reduces the depth of the lower vestibule when it contracts. This muscle is capable of dislodging the mandibular denture, especially when the residual ridge is at the same height as the origin of the muscle. This is the case when the ridge resorbs severely, as seen on this cast. It definitely dis dictates the length of the extension of the labial flange. Surgical repositioning of the muscle is sometimes used to extend the flange area. The alveolar ridge is a secondary support area. It has a high rate of resorption when excessive pressure is applied to this area. The labial frenum, histologically and functionally, is the same as in the maxilla. It is mucous membrane without significant muscle fibers. Underlying muscle fibers in this area are the incisivus labi inferioris and depressor labi inferioris. The buccal frenum, histologically and functionally, is the same as the maxilla also. The muscles beneath this frenum, the depressor anguli oris, can definitely have an effect on the stability of the denture. When the muscle flexes, it is capable of raising the denture. The alveolar ridge is a secondary support area. Remember that there's a high rate of resorption when excessive pressure is applied to this area. The buccal frenum, note the medium attachment on this buccal frenum. This buccal frenum has a higher attachment than on the previous slide. The denture has to be relieved more aggressively to keep this muscle in function from lifting the denture. The buccal shelf is bordered externally by the external oblique line and internally by the slope of the residual ridge. This region is the primary stress bearing area of the mandibular arch. The buccal shelf is a prime support area because it is parallel to the occlusal plane and the bone is very dense. These Two factors make it relatively resistant to resorption. The greater the access to the buccal shelf, the more support there is available for the denture. Access is determined by the attachment of the buccinator muscle. One constant, relatively unchanging structure on the mandibular denture bearing surface is the retromolar pad. The pad contains glandular tissue, loose areolar connective tissue, the lower margin of the pterygomandibular raphe, fibers of buccinator and the superior constrictor muscle, and fibers of the temporal tendon. The bone beneath does not resorb secondary to pressure associated with the denture use. The retromolar pad is one of the primary support areas. Note the masseter groove. The action of the masseter muscle reflects the buccinator muscle in a superior and medial direction. The distal buccal flange of the denture has to be contoured to allow freedom for this muscle, otherwise the denture will be displaced or the patient will experience soreness in this area. The external oblique line is a ridge of dense bone from the mental foramen coursing superiorly and distally to become continuous with the anterior region of the ramus. This line is the attachment site of the buccinator muscle and an anatomic guide for the lateral termination of the buccal flange of the mandibular denture. Genial tubercles or mental spines are present on the anterior lingual surface of the mandible and serve as an attachment site for the genioglossus and the geniohyoid muscles. In patients with severe ridge resorption, the genial tubercles may cause discomfort if they are pinched upon by the denture flange. The lingual frenum overlies the genioglossus muscle, which takes its origin from the superior genial spines. Sublingual folds are formed by the superior surface of the sublingual glands and the ducts of the submandibular glands. You can palpate the mylohyoid ridge to determine its contour, sharpness, and degree of undercut. A sharp mylohyoid ridge can present problems of irritation during the adjustment phase.
the skin over this area is very, very thin. Take a look at the muscles of the floor of the mouth. Look at the fibers of the mylohyoid ridge. Note that they are short in that premolar to premolar area and the flange cannot go below these fibers in that area. Look at the attachment in the posterior area. Remember that our denture can violate that muscle slightly in that posterior area from the molar to the retromylohyoid fossa. Kind of envision what the lingual flange of a mandibular denture would look like in relation to this muscle. The retromylohyoid space lies at the distal end of the alveololingual sulcus. It is important in the construction of the mandibular denture in that the denture does have to extend into this area. Because of the depression or a little bit of an undercut in that area, we can gain some retention for the mandibular denture by extending it into this area. The suprahyoid muscles function in elevation of the hyoid bone and the larynx and depression of the mandible. They are digastric, stylohyoid, mylohyoid, geniohyoid. The mylohyoid muscle arises from the ridge on the mandible. Um, it determines the lingual extent of the mandibular denture. Note how this line gets closer to the ridge as resorption takes place. The intrinsic muscles originate and insert within the tongue and produce changes in the shape of the tongue. The extrinsic muscles originate in structures outside of the tongue and can move the tongue and alter its shape. They are genioglossus, styloglossus, hyoglossus, and palatoglossus. The denture flange must be contoured to allow the tongue to have its normal range of function and movement. Approximately 35% of the tongues are abnormal in either size, position, or shape. A retruded tongue, as shown in this picture, is very unfavorable for denture retention and stability. Support and retention are affected by the shape of the residual ridge. You can see how these various ridges shown in these pictures might affect retention and stability of the denture. On the bottom right, this is a ridge that has undergone extreme resorption and you can only imagine a denture as far as the types of retention that you can get on this type of a ridge. This ridge here on the left has an extremely knife-edged, sharp, bony ridge. Also it is undercut in the posterior right side of the patient. This too would be a very uncomfortable situation for the patient and a dip more difficult a denture to get comfortable for your patient. It gets progressively better as we go up here to the right, but you still have a pretty sharp, lumpy, bony type of ridge. Over here you have the broad ridge where you can get um, easier retention and stability than those others. The size and position of the buc buccal shelf vary relative to the degree of alveolar resorption. You can see this in these three pictures. Note that that buccal shelf is the extent <clears throat> of the buccal flange and the more resorption that takes place it compromises the stability of the denture. This picture on the left shows the resorption of the mandible over time. Note how the uh, placement of the uh, mental nerve and the mental foramen become positioned on top of the ridge as the mandible resorbs severely. On the right side, this shows a denture in place. Look at the resorption pattern and note how the denture becomes more uh, or moves more anteriorly, which means that that mandible will take a position more like a class 3 mandible as far as angles classification as resorption takes place. The mental foramen is the anterior exit of the mandibular canal and the inferior alveolar nerve. In cases of severe resorption, the foramen occupies a more superior position and the denture base must be relieved to prevent nerve compression and pain for the patient. Note the position of the mylohyoid ridge on the lingual as it varies relative to the degree of alveolar resorption that has taken place. Generally, the muscles of facial expression do not insert on bone or have very little amount of insertion on bone. They need support from the teeth and the denture base for proper function. Those muscles are the modiolus, buccinator, mentalis, 
incisivus labi superioris, incisivus labi inferioris, abicularis oris, and zygomaticus major. The modiolus is a concentration of several muscle groups and is situated laterally and slightly superior to the corners of the mouth. This is the area where extrinsic perioral muscles decussate to join intrinsic fibers of the orbicularis oris muscle. It is a very forceful area which can influence the labial flange thickness of the maxillary denture. The buccinator provides support and mobility of the soft tissues of the cheek. The muscle fibers contract in a line parallel to the plane of occlusion. As people age, tension is lost in this muscle, which predisposes uh, the patient to cheek biting. In sisyphus labi superioris and inferioris, their actions on the vestibular fornix are similar to that of the mentalis muscle. The mentalis muscle elevates the skin of the chin and turns the lower lip outward. It dictates the length and the thickness of the labial flange extension of the lower denture. Obicularis oris is the sphincter muscle of the mouth. It has a slight or small amount of skeletal attachment. It's a composite muscle and is composed not only of the intrinsic fibers but also of extrinsic fibers of many muscles that converge at the modiolus. The zygomaticus major muscle is a muscle of facial expression, which draws the angle of the mouth superiorly and posteriorly. Like all muscles of facial expression, the zygomatic major muscle is innervated by the facial nerve, or the cranial nerve number seven. The zygomaticus extends from each zygomatic arch, or the cheekbone, to the corners of the mouth. It raises the corners of the mouth when a person smiles. It influences the denture in that area. This slide shows a wax up that a student did with red wax uh, showing the various muscles on the face. Here is one of those slides that just shows a section of the mandible where you can see the actual muscle dissection and their position relative to the mandible. A special thanks uh, to the University of California, Los Angeles and the use of their slides that were produced in conjunction with um, Ivoclair uh, Vivident Company and the American College of Prosthodontists. Also to Dr. Jack Morris for some of the materials that he has in his collection.